What have you been up to, bro? Uh, studying. Yeah. You know. Studying business. Trying to stay in shape. Yeah. And I'm reading a lot. Have you been now? Still. We're not as much as last year, but I'm trying. This year, the first book I read this year was Daniel Kahneman. I was reading Thinking Fast and Slow. Oh yeah, I haven't read that one, but it looks really good. A month, dude. Is it is it a good read? It's really interesting. It's really interesting, but it's like kind of, kind of dull. I like Sapiens. I am meaning to read Homo Deus. I have it right here. That was that's a really good one too. I I think that his third book, The Twenty One Rules for the Twenty First Century, mm-hmm. is um is kind of interesting because it's practical right now advice okay. from his perspective as a historian and someone who's kind of looking to the future with the historical lens. Mm-hmm. But um but definitely read the first two books first because it. it they give a lot of insight into the third one. I do one. have the third one there. I um right now what I'm reading. Well, I'm reading, let's see. So I'm reading Haruki Murakami right now. It's like pretty good. It's like oh, a yeah. fiction guy. Yeah, he's he's like one of the most famous Japanese like he, writers. He is. He's one of the biggest fiction authors in the world right now. Yeah, I look I I was reading like a list the other day and he was like number three or something. I read Kafka on the Shore, ones. and this is his other really popular book. Isn't that the, is the same one who did the um the Norwegian wood, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. I haven't read that, but it's on the list. What's interesting is he started writing when he was like 35. Yeah. Yeah, he, he for, studied he like a, for a while, right? New Yorker article. He has like New York articles and he goes into it. He was running like a jazz club. Yeah. Yeah. He started running like with his, with his wife, right? Like ultra marathons and like yeah really crazy super interesting um background right yeah weird he was like oh i started writing for fun and like he put it into a random contest like one mm-hmm. of the newspaper contests or something and it won first place and he got like a ton of recognition yeah it's, it's crazy that sometimes time. that happens he was like i don't even care if it's good he literally said he's like i don't know why it's like so interesting to people but i just put it out because i'm bored yeah, like, I'd write it from three to five a.m. after I got off from looking after the club. It's ridiculous. And I'm yeah. reading Lean Startup. And oh yeah. Meditations, which is yeah. like Marcus Aurelius. Yeah. Stoicism. But it's a really interesting um school of thought for sure. And, I, and Tim Ferriss always talks about. It. He always talks about stoicism. He does always a lot. And whether it's like Epictetus or Seneca, it's like, yeah, he always, he, I think Tim Ferriss is like the most stoic person. He's like a rock. Like he's yeah. like emotions. <laughs> I yeah. He's like, oh, but. he's like yeah. a, uh, a rational yeah. stoic. He's just all like about what's the best move kind of right yeah. now, but very non-emotional. Have you read um, Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance? No, but it's on the list. Yeah, I just finished reading that yesterday actually and uh and he talks a lot about some of the different kind of philosophical schools of thought and reasoning and how our world has become dominated by rationality but how really like it's such an arbitrary thing to be dominated by if you think about it and i was i've never read anything like that and as someone who studies science it's just always been a given that like that's just the best way to think about the world so interesting to see alternative perspectives and be like wow even these things we take for granted are not necessarily you would love thinking fast and slow dude you'd really love it like how science like it's so cool i'll I'll have to i'll definitely have to read it like yeah it's crazy and humans it's massive (laughs) massive. i respect that i only got i got this guy it's a little guy i don't have a big jug yeah so what have you been what is your kind of go-to in the gym right now my go-to yeah i want to be I wanna, if i if i want to be big like max how do i how do i pull it off <laughs> oh, i'm kind of lazy recently um i've been slacking on my compounds is it like yeah. low reps of really high weights is that kind of your thing not anymore i'm just kind of like just get a pump but that's how you build up right like when you were doing it that's what you did like eight to twelve reps anything yeah. too low you're gonna build more your cns like yeah. and you're, it's, you're just gonna load your mental kind of to push more weight, but yeah, it doesn't directly translate to muscle growth. But muscle growth doesn't—you can do anything, I think, in 
grow muscle. It's, it's just a consistency thing. I think that there's, there's a, a couple of things going on though, that are always like body types, obviously one thing. Um, and the other thing is, at least for me, I've found that the times I'm strongest, I don't necessarily look super big mm. because it's usually like when I'm really compact, like my muscle, her like strength kind of unit is super efficient because I need to minimize it for whenever I'm running and maximize it for whenever I'm pushing mm. or pulling or whatever. Um, but I don't know. I found like the times when I, I, I look a little bit bigger, I'm not necessarily stronger per se. It makes it's sense just that I haven't been doing as much cardio usually. No muscle size isn't like directly tied to strength. It can mm -hmm. be it, like you can, you can be strong and big, but it, they're not like exclusive. Like, yeah. Like if you look at the kind of Olympic weightlifter guys, you, you well, there's like the heavy, heavy weight guys are just like massive. They're like kind yeah. of what you'd probably describe as fat slash really strong <laughs> right but then you get those just super super ripped guys that it's like if they were wearing a shirt you'd be like this guy's not super big and then they're just like you take their shirt off you're like yeah, the leaner you are the less you've shown yeah it's yeah crazy. a sure. lot of the huge like tree trunk neck guys they don't lift that much in ratio to how they look yeah because they're just focusing on getting the the blood and the muscle and it's really working like that not really strength there's not a ton of huge bodybuilders that push the weight at that level yeah like coleman you look at ronnie coleman or chris bumstead and they're actually pushing that weight it's kind of rare with the huge guys yeah it definitely seems like a different approach right like if you're yeah, trying to look big guys at the level wrong. lift four times as much as me but just in that kind of ratio with them yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're still they're still doing okay <laughs> <laughs> all right <laughs> okay. yeah that's that's so true i don't know i think anytime somebody looks uncomfortable like whenever you look at someone you're like that's you shouldn't look like that it's probably like not for the that's probably not healthy <laughs> like whenever somebody's like so big that they can like barely move you're like yeah not super down <laughs> they really gotta love it i mean at that point and they're not making the, all their money they make isn't from the winnings of the tournament it's kind of like a passion side hustle type of thing yeah. or once they reach that level it's all from sponsors yeah like sports nigger or something yeah like it's all sponsors or they come up with their own line but it's not the actual competitions themselves mm. that pay them. but yeah but it can it give you a lot of exposure right like yeah, to, to those sure. sponsors or, or the sponsors but it's not directly to, even bumps like chris bumstead won uh the classic physique okay thing and I think he won like 400 grand, but he's like the best in the world. Like mm -hmm. number one, the guys making 400 grand. You think maybe like Ronnie Coleman or any of those other guys are making millions. Like it's, you got to love it. Cause the, if the top guys getting 400 grand, second guy's probably getting 250. And then, then it goes down kind of exponentially from there. Yeah. It's such a superstar market too, right? Like if you're not number one or two, there's nothing for you there. Exactly. And it's all like, you have to work hard. You have to have the right training, nutrition, whatever. But if you don't have the right muscle insertions, muscle belly size, you're not going to make it. That's purely genetic. You can't alter that. Your abs, if they're misaligned, mm. like you can't do anything. Yeah. I guess it's just so tricky when it's, when you're only rewarded for being the best of the best, because someone else who has equal work ethic you can be the hardest worker in the room but if you don't have the best genetics and are the hardest worker in the room then you're not going to win because someone else is going to have both crazy it's ridiculous it's like one but, of those things with like you really gotta love doing it like you can't you can't slack it's like with any i guess endeavor like it should be like that with any endeavor though like with acting it's like anything like that or like kind of out of the ordinary you're the roi on paper is not positive. You got to make up for that with your love for it kind of thing. Yeah. yeah it really, it really is one of those things. Um, it's not a good investment. Of you know, if, you're like just, if you're just like an economist, maybe yeah. don't, maybe don't do that for, for, uh, you really got to gotta like supplement it with your, yeah. your own drive and with supplements because and you're competing with a lot of people. <laughs> Damn. So have you been studying, uh, kinesiology related things as well or are you just mostly no, focusing on this? Really. 
I watch a lot of you YouTube guys, but not on like a scientific level. Hmm. Well, I think it's like the practical understanding is all you really need to be hmm. super successful in that anyways, right? Hmm. Like and a, overall, I don't care. Like if you, if you start going to the gym for a month and you look at every scientific article and you follow all the stuff, you can have the knowledge in here, but it's, it won't show unless you're just consistent. You just have to be consistent with it. You can know nothing and go to the gym and randomly pick machines. And if you're consistent, you'll, you'll build up, you know, like de a yeah. decent amount of muscle. If you pick them poorly, you might have really weird kind of proportions. Yeah. You know, potentially <laughs> like really, really big forearms and like no muscle on here. Yeah. So, okay. Let's talk a little bit about, um, about the consistency element of exercise, because both of us have, um, been, I guess, exercise enthusiasts for quite a while, oh, but, um, but, um, in your experience, cause I know like. And I'm not like calling you out or anything, but like, I know you've had times when you're like less consistent and you've had times like right now, or like since graduation where it's super apparent that you were consistent for at least okay. really long, like at least a few months or years kind of thing. So do you want to talk a little bit about like your experience with working towards consistency in that? And then maybe how that relates to other elements of your life? Yeah. Well, it's one of those things where it's not to like it's compounding like I don't want to use that word a ton but you know everything with consistency is compounding on itself and you got to understand that once you get a role going you got to keep up and it's not like a motivation thing mm -hmm. because are you motivated to go to the gym every day no are you motivated to eat well no I'm not motivated to do that but I'm disciplined enough to do it so motivation won't take you there long term but discipline will take you there long term yeah. like your motivation it's not going to be there forever like how are you going to depend on something external like it's not it's, it just doesn't work it's i guess it's like work. the importance of habits right like yeah. forming these habits that kind of uh continue even when you're not in the mood and you got to realize like if you want if you really want to do something that can't change day to day you have to have that you know consistency with how you and you have to it's a lifestyle thing it's not Oh, I'm on keto. I'm on all this stuff. Like I'm going to drop this weight super fast. It shouldn't matter if it's fast or not in five years. It doesn't matter how fast it's, if you can keep it up until then, that's all that matters. You got to think, you know, the long, the long term route. You can't, if it's short term, you're going to lose short term too. Yeah. And even if you win short term, it's, you know, it's if not necessarily. Easy. And then if you get something really quick, short term, it's fast. It's too easy. And to control that and maintain it, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, I think whenever you're trying to, to do something and you're really interested in it, you have a certain degree of motivation in the beginning. And it can be tempting to think that that motivation is going to last, but you have to, even with the things that you really love, you have to build those habits and say, Hey, look, right now, this is fun. But when this isn't fun, I, I recognize that this is going to still be important. And so I'm going to have to figure out a way to make this continue to be implementable in my life. Absolutely. And I think that also you need to, you can't stack yourself up with too many little things. I want to do this, 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 this. At first, you got to kind of grow, plant that seed, grow that one thing you want to do and let it take up a bit of your schedule every day you have to devote some time to it set it aside it can't be something you're trying to fit in every day it's not going to work it won't happen yeah. it just won't happen you got to. i want to go for a half an hour run in the morning you have to put time for that every single day not like today do i have time for to go for that because you're going to run into that time where you can't do it and then that train stops there yeah and then you just start lowering the barrier for what qualifies a reasonable excuse not to do it until everything's a reasonable excuse like yeah. i'm kind of tired today becomes a reasonable excuse and then you're screwed for that excuse too you know it's confirmation bias you're gonna find it yeah you will find that excuse if you're looking for it yeah and just understanding a little bit about the psychology of, of how we work just is super helpful because then you can see that we're not these machines that work super efficiently we're super prone to all sorts of distractions, all sorts of 
perturbations of whatever we're trying to do. Exactly. So. Oh, look at this guy. He did this, but there's a guy who did the exact opposite and he was successful too. Like you're looking at, yeah, just, you just stick to your path, do it with your own hands, do it yourself. Like there's never going to be a perfect example for you to follow. You have to really look at it. And there's always this outcome bias, hindsight bias, whatever you want to label it. And you're just mm. pulling stuff from other people. Just do it yourself and see what happens. I think that's really interesting what you say about kind of going back and forth and seeing that sometimes there's opposites that seem to both be effective. And it's sometimes difficult to, uh, to decide which path to follow. Cause you always feel that, am I going to take the wrong path? Is that going to ruin everything? But I don't know. I think it's, it's counterintuitive. Uh, but it seems to be, at least for me, every time that something works, it's just picking your poison and doing something. Right. Yeah, like just right. choose to do something. And then at the end, if it's bad or even halfway through, if you realize this thing's wrong, make a 180, but just don't go like at a diagonal the whole way. Cause you're never going to get anywhere. You absolutely have to, you know, build that intuition. Okay. Cause it's a skill in that certain area. If you're doing gym related stuff, you can kind of build that. What do I feel like is right right now without looking at who did what, mm. because those external influences will mess up your, your own intuition kind of thing. You're going to lose that muscle. Yeah. How do you, how do you build, how do you find that, uh, building intuition, like in your, uh, direction? Like, do you have particular people that you kind of follow or have you just been following what works for you? Mm -hmm. I think reading is good because, um, you kind of, okay. Cause when, when you read it's, you're not going to remember everything it's impossible you're not going to read a book and be able to list each chapter and what the important parts yeah. are unless it's you're like bill gates like, or something somehow yeah like, <laughs> you gotta be a robot i think yeah. the real benefit of reading is kind of getting the mindset of the author down how they think and how mm. they see problems i think that's really the beneficial part of reading and i think that can that's help really build it. intuition based on like oh in that situation what they were kind of feeling and you go oh i kind of think like that maybe you identify with certain authors over others but i think do you find this that, particularly for nonfiction, or do you find this for fiction as well um, i find that with nonfiction, but with fiction i with fiction it's interesting because most people are like oh it's stories it's not like bill gates probably doesn't read fiction like these guys probably don't read fiction galio but I think fiction really helps build like empathy kind of if that yeah, makes sense. Definitely. like seeing how that character would see certain problems and thinking how they would solve it like as you're reading yeah. go, oh that makes sense oh like you kind of you're in that mindset of the character yeah and I think that with fictional writing sometimes it's describes things that can't be described by just looking at something exactly as it is. You have to kind of describe the reflection or the shadow or some sort of element of something in order to understand what it is. And you can only, there's so many things that we know intuitively, as you say, as humans, but we can't necessarily express it verbally because you're limited with a certain amount of words yeah. and creativity is kind of one of those things that allows you to novelly combine those words. And even you look at nonfiction books, it's not like they're dry and factual, like some of them are, the ones you read in school are, but those ones you don't learn as much from as you do from something like principles or something that is, it uses all these metaphors and imagery. And in a way it's, it's almost like a fictional approach to telling a truthful story, you know, mm -hmm. or it, I guess fiction is also truthful in its own way, but, but yeah. yeah. And also those imaginary circumstances, they do put that character in is something you would never encounter in real life. And it gives you that, stretch mm. in your brain you know and it gives you exposure to things you might not have had right like if i'm living you you and i were living in canada or this we're exposed to these different things mm -hmm. but how can we empathize with you know somebody who grew up in like mumbai or something right. the only way you can do that is by reading some kind of story and then seeing hey this person is like me in a lot of ways or like somebody I know, or wait, we're not that different after all kind of idea. I think that's really, like you said, with empathy, it's super, super important. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think intuition has a lot to do with the, the limbic part of the brain, where it's not directly in words, like you can't putting words to it's using 
like the neocortex or like if you're putting you have to put words to it but they're not exactly what you're feeling yeah so like developing that it's not a concrete thing to do it's just you have to just surround yourself with information and just you might have to build that muscle that's it you can't really do anything else yeah no that's absolutely right there's a lot of the understanding of intuition is kind of not fully well understood because it's one of those things like consciousness or something yeah. where it's like yeah. <laughs> how do you define it like what exactly is it but yeah i think the kind of general understanding of intuition is knowing something that you know it's a type of kind of procedural memory of sorts but isn't a physical thing it's like a spiritual or emotional thing where you're like i just have this feeling about this and so yeah that's super involved with the limbic system and it's it's super interesting how um the more we learn to describe ourselves scientifically the more we realize that it's like not the sum of its parts it's like one plus one equals three and that's right. pretty cool yeah it's not a linear kind of you put it together like lego it's like it's just yeah. this other beast and you know yeah. Yeah, yeah that's why like i don't know that's why however much i love ex machina or something it's like those kind of things um at least fully understanding it we're not going to be able to completely like there's a lot of it that with say machine learning or something it can iterate things you don't understand but it's not going to be like a human it'll just be different in its own way if you create some sort of um some sort of thing that's true you're trying to replicate a human it's it's not just correctly wiring it that's not going to make it exactly the same right because it's just it's too complicated for that and it's very hard for us to imagine things that haven't already happened because we always, whether we like that, we subconsciously draw off past events and stuff. And it, oh, it'll be, probably be like this because something like that has happened before. It's not something new. And yet it's the only real differentiation between humans and other animals is the ability to delay gratification and imagine something that hasn't yet happened. Yeah. I mean, like, there's a reason that we have cities and Harari stuff. Right? Sorry? And like in Sapiens, Harari talks about like the stuff that sets humans apart from everything else, that imagination, that kind of. Yeah. Empathy. And his, his understanding of story is really like kind of one of the major impetuses for this podcast. Um, I was just like, everything seems to be story related. You know, everything seems to just be, at least for what we do as humans, that we have these kind of on, on every level, right? You look at society, it's built off a series of stories that are you know like credit that's a story or a particular governmental system like democracy that's a story monotheism that's a story like everything's a story never mind you know capitalism and what brands you buy because you relate with them and all that storytelling yeah in it more specific day. exactly no it's so true like you you buy something like nike and you think you're getting a physical thing it's like no no, no you're you're buying a story you're buying into a and, into a brand which is by definition a story and like past like a commodity level why buy nike over adidas or puma and like how you relate with certain things it's all just continuously going in your head you're not it's not a conscious decision like to put it to words would be not completely there like with the the whole limbic thing it's like you just you do relate to one more than the other and that's it yeah it's super story. interesting so so you've been for the past almost year right you've been studying uh business business administration is it or yeah. yeah so what does that look like do you mostly study economics and business and math kind of idea I or uh, i did calc yeah um, how, how, how did you like that kind of sucks i like econ i love econ calc was i actually i got by on calc um it was yeah. tough online online's been kind of terrible i don't know <laughs> yeah kind of bad especially with the actual business classes which are all group projects basically because mm. that's i mean business is you know communication that's like the main thing if yeah. you can't communicate in business here it's kaput like you have to do yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's so hard because you can't see people face to face really and you're joining these random zoom calls and you don't have the time in class to talk to your team yeah members. you have like yeah. one person like the professor and one person's face are on like <laughs> a video yeah. and everyone else is just a blank screen yeah exactly exactly <laughs> kind of sucks i don't know I don't, I don't have like a ton to say on it because it hasn't really been that 
formative? Um, hasn't really changed any thing up here. Like I, I it didn't change any course of thought mm. or anything. Kind of like spoon fed. Do you want to talk about why you f you feel that way? Because because uh, I'm not sure we have the exact same things, but I definitely do I feel of, the same kind of artificiality of education system sometimes. I think. Like, I don't know when these curriculums are made necessarily, but they're not updated year to year. Yeah. And often people develop the skills needed for those classes just in real life. They were made 150 years ago. <laughs> they weren't updated since then. <laughs> it's like, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't really feel like I'm really learning a ton. I like working with other people, but that isn't directly tied to a class and its curriculum. You know, like, I think, uh, mm. you know, like collaboration is the most important thing, but you talk about like a selling course or HR management, it's like, yada, yada, yada. It's not anything that's going to change how you think about a certain thing. And I, I guess could read, I could read a 20 page pamphlet and learn a class based off what they're kind of teaching right now. Yeah, I guess it's also, it's kind of like similar to law in a way that you can learn everything about every kind of legal system. But um, at the end of the day, whatever you're going to be doing, is going to be super hyper focused because we live in a specialist world. Yep. Um, and there is a lot of value in interdisciplinary readings and understandings and knowing a lot of things, especially um, as most people don't have that value. But with universities, they seem to make it so learn all this random stuff that's super wide and then forget it and go into the super specific thing. Like, I don't, I'm just not super convinced on that being the I've best of often learn everything on the job anyways. Mm -hmm. Like it's not really, and it is a specialist uh, society with, you know, globalization. Everyone can do freelance work everywhere. And that's becoming that huge thing. And, you know, Naval Ravikant with, loves talking about that. Like Naval Ravikant loves talking about how in the future, everyone is going to have their own almost company. Everyone's going to be a freelancer doing everything because everything's going to reach the automation level and everyone yeah. there's not going to be any big companies. And that's what he's thinking, maybe to an extreme, but you do see that kind of playing out. Yeah, you, I could definitely see that going that direction. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Um, it's it's like as more countries kind of come out of poverty and it's really like, I just finished reading a book Factfulness where they talk about um, how things are actually so much better than we think they are. Like on, they did, they did these um, statistical uh, surveys on people to see how well they understood the world. Like in your, do you think that suicide rates are going up down or staying the same do you think that global poverty is doing this doing going getting better or getting worse or whatever all these kind of questions and they scored not just bad but like they also did the tests on chimpanzees just to see like the random control of like they would get it like one third of the time if it's a three question multiple choice thing and humans got it right in most groups less than 25 percent of the time so it's just like it's like, we're not even just not good. We're like biased towards seeing the worst. And I think it's especially because of how uh, media systems are. And I think like what you're talking about with the idea of everyone running their own company and stuff, a lot of people would think kind of cynically and be like, oh, that'll never work. There's no way, but it does seem that it's actually quite possible for everyone to be wealthier and everyone to kind of do better overall. Like as long as we don't destroy ourselves politically or whatever <laughs> i do think pessimism kind of rules everything right now like it's it just kind of seems to be in that mindset like it's very common mm. like a ton of people they love to nitpick other people and cancel culture whatever you want to say people are always yeah. looking for things to tear down or critique or i think it probably comes know. out of an insecurity though like people just don't don't it's have so widespread it's the majority I'd say it's all it's like on social media though yeah like i i was what your eyes see yeah, yeah i think factfulness like really helped me to understand that whenever you're watching like a media system 
um, of any sort, you're going to get the 1% of the news that they think is most important. And it's going to be unbelievably biased to the most negative things that they think is most important. Like they're not going to tell you like breaking news overall, like suicide rates have decreased 50%. Like, you never hear that. Even if that's true, they're going to be like, there's a pandemic and like all this bad stuff's happening and, and it's useful running that same one percent over and over and driving to the ground like yeah and, and we need to know some of this stuff which is important but i think mm -hmm. the same thing with with the kind of cancel culture whatever um i don't think everyone's like that i just think that there's like it's very easy to not be yourself when you're on social media and people just see something and then they just retweet it without really thinking and then you get these inflated things where it looks like 10,000 people hated your thing, but probably 10 people read it and everyone else just saw that this person that they looked up to read it and didn't like it. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I completely agree with that. And the influence of those people, I kind of take back what I said. I, I mean, like, not everyone's pessimistic, but it's what the media outlets kind of pick up on. They drive that pessimistic news article that will get those eyes on or else it's like, what's the point of them existing if it's not something that's going to catch your eye? Mm, yeah, no, I think that's, that's true. And I think that people who try to do honest journalism um, are not rewarded for it and often fired because they're you not know, getting enough people watching it people like drama, right? Like the extremes. And it's sad, but like, there's there is no money in something that's not gonna have eyes on it you need. That's the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Which is why honest journalism like it's, it's almost impossible for it to scale to that level of everything else it's just yeah it's really interesting because we also forget that the world is unbelievably better than it used to be like yeah right. you, you have a you have a toilet you have like right. running water uh -huh. like you're living in days. a house and you can do whatever you want and not starve it's like when ever for any organism has that even been feasible, you know? And I think that it's just, it's just tricky because it's like, we have these biological needs to feel stress and to it's useful and helpful and also to be anxious and to fight against tyranny or whatever. But now they're being applied to these, like maybe less important ideas sometimes because people are just saying, Oh, I need something to get my, anger out at you know and it's like yeah you probably do there's bad things happening i'm not denying that in any way shape or form but it would be more productive if everyone just said okay here's a problem how can i fix it instead of saying here's a problem how can i yell at the yeah. some you know unnamed oppressor who technically is only like one of many variables and i'm probably also one of those variables you know and it's never really the root of the problem that gets attacked. It's kind of that surface level stuff that'll change day to day. And next week mm. it's something else. It's never the deeper kind of source of that issue. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's true. It's, it's hard to address those really deep things. And so people look for kind of a surface level manifestation of something and put yeah, all there's the blame no way, on that. There's no way to do it. I'm not saying it's like, oh, you should have gone to the deeper, but it's like, it's just the way it is. Yeah. And those things, those surface level things won't stop coming. Yeah. Like it's, I don't know that there is a solution to some of these issues, but. Yeah. It's like we built a system and if you completely tear down everything, then you have nothing. So you can do that. That's one, that's one option. But then, you know, that's probably, you can see pretty obviously that that will make things worse even though it makes some things less worse it'll make everything more worse so like if yeah. this is the worst thing and this is the best thing it'll just go like like up a tiny bit you know it's like good job yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um but i think that what you're saying too you have to um you have to kind of work on whatever you can you can only focus on your thing right yeah and, and your and, circle of influence Stephen Covey, whatever. Yeah, yeah, he's that. That's a good, a really good message too. Um, did you read that uh, that book? The was it Seven Rules for No Seven, seven habits. Yep. habits of Highly Effective People. Yeah, it's, it's a, a bit of a dense read, right? It's very dense. Yeah, it's a good one. Though. 
but it's it reminds me a lot of stoicism like to go back to stoicism like yeah the whole thing of like you're the rock in the river and everything's kind of flowing past you kind of thing like circle of influence like don't worry about the other stuff going around stuff within your reach that matters yeah it's like um yeah it kind of reminds me of something uh that i was just reading beyond order jordan peterson's new book and he talks about uh kind of the hierarchy of solving problems about how you kind of have to figure out your own thing solve your own problems and then once that works well you know you move up to the next thing start solving slightly more complex problems and moving up that way and that really does seem like a good approach in most areas of life um because obviously there's there's so many things that we don't know both you and i were young we're trying to figure these things out right. um, but the best thing we can do is just see in ourselves what can we get in order what kind of habits can we build how can i you know go consistently to the gym and work on that kind of stuff and once you have a life where you're you know you're pretty consistent you're working on things then maybe you look up a little bit and say what's the next kind of bigger thing i can tackle sure. right because the worst thing you can do is oversimplify a super complex problem because that'll just like i mean if the 20th century is not a kind of example of anything it's that these extreme idealistic kind of visions of things can be really dangerous if they're pinned on one person to blame and one or one people group to blame and one people Nothing group is to protect. Ever that simple it's never that simple as to this person's doing this and it's doing that it's not like that it everything's deeper there's more people to it it's way more complex and you could put a diagram to like it's yeah it's just stuff you, you have to work at chip away at issues but not like the scapegoats and like oh this must be the guy like it's never yeah. like, it's, i don't know and i think even within yourself that same kind of hierarchy exists where you could blame you know this is a problem i'm having and it's because of this part of this personality trait or this piece of me but it's never like that it's always just a bunch of habits or a bunch of things and you just have to try to identify little things to change and like, you know, there might come a time where you have to completely do a 180 and say, you know, I, my approach to this thing is wrong. But I think if you're always like, I don't know, self flagellating yourself for every mistake you make, then that's kind of counterproductive too. Mm -hmm. Like you have to, you have you to do anything about it immediately. There's no use in worrying about it. It's just building that, you know, anxiety like it's a circle of influence if you can't change something immediately there's no use worrying about it you can't worry about it it's useless it's you're directing your energy somewhere that it won't be valued mm. yeah yeah i think that's i think that's super super potent potent as they say how do you think learning and reading has helped like do you think there's certain books you read where it changes everything you look at Mm hmm. Yeah. Are you asking like if I have any specific yeah, books? Do you have, or just like have you has that happened? Are there books? Yeah, definitely. Um, sometimes there's authors too, mm. like with Noah Yuval Harari. I think all three of his books, in combination, me reading all of them was super m mind opening, um, and. Kazuo Ishiguro, who's a, uh, I don't know if you've read any of his works, but he was the Nobel laureate for literature in 2017 or 2016, 2016, I think, I think it was um, Bob Dylan in 2017, but, um, but he, he's a fiction writer, but just his emphasis on certain thematic elements in all of his books, he really focuses on, uh, kind of memory and how it's not that kind of stable and how it so his characters don't remember things perfectly mm. and it's super emotionally in depth and I just found the level of empathy that I developed through reading his works was super important for myself um but yeah I totally feel that certain books impact how you think of things 
Uh, and like you said at the very beginning, that really resonated with me. It's kind of an intuition thing. It's not that I remember every line, sometimes specific lines stick with me, but it's mostly, I remember the gist of it, or I remember the the feeling that it, it gave me, or just I, yeah. I, for the first time, the, the way of thinking about it. But, but what about yourself? Have you, have you had specific books similar to that? I think I have, like, uh, I, I really think that, like, for example, Murakami's books, they do have that very dreamlike, ethereal, like, you get that feeling with it, and... Yeah, I gotta read, I gotta read those. Really interesting, and I don't know, I think even after reading those books, it kind of changed, it puts, like, a new filter on over, and you kind of look at things differently. I think that's interesting, but I think overall what I find with those books is they compound on each other. Like if you read it, you probably found as you read books, you'll go, oh, this is like that. And you pull it together and you're kind of pulling these ideas into certain genres almost that they fit with. Mm. Like that builds on Galio's idea and Covey's idea and Dale Carnegie. And like, you kind of build this huge mass just based on different information that kind of matches with each other. Yeah. Definitely understanding certain people's thoughts and you can tell they've probably read that book that you read kind of thing. Yeah. And sometimes they seem to not even be in the same genre, like they're different yeah. styles, but yet the, the ideas or the feelings or something about it just totally reminds you of some other book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think that, um, I think it's almost like every book kind of builds to a degree as well. You know, it's even even and maybe especially when you read books that have differing ideas, mm. because as you said earlier, the confirmation bias element it exists with books too, and we sometimes tend to choose books that seem to be aligned with what we think. Absolutely. Um, and I know for myself, like it was, it's not. I'm not like I can't be sanctimonious or anything about it because it was accidental. A lot of in the early times that I read books that challenged my ways I thought about things I thought they were going to be in line with how I thought and then they were different and I was like mm -hmm. but that book totally convinced me of that and it was different so how do I have I believed that idea and I believe this idea which are opposite how do I reconcile that and that just yeah. causes you to have to think about things differently and say really cool. yeah it becomes very That's complex a really interesting point yeah. yeah, have you found that with any books that you've read? Yeah, well, I feel like I haven't gone into a ton of fiction. I read a lot of Hemingway last year. I don't know why. I was on a Hemingway tear. Yeah, you told me about I that. Of, like, bleak, Hemingway is amazing, like, though. Heavy, bleak world. And then going to Haruki Murakami or Ian Martel, like something that's like much. It's just very interesting to see the conflicting ideas. Yeah. And it's more so the conflicting emotions of the books than the actual, <laughs> yeah. Dude, have you read Farewell to Arms? I haven't. The ending, do you know what happens the at list. the end? I don't, don't tell, don't Destroyed spoil it. Destroyed me. Destroyed don't spoil me. it. I'm going to read it for sure. I've read um, The Old Man in the Sea, Sun Also Rises, and For Whom the Bell Tolls. Those are the only ones I've read. I have For Whom the Bell Tolls, but it, I've just never started. I oh. love for Whom the Bell Tolls, I think, is my favorite Hemingway. Really? It's the first one I read, so there's that bias, too. But, um, and it's set in Spain, so there's, like, that cultural element that I've always been super interested in as well, like, since I was young. But, um, well, I guess he, all, a lot of his books have, like, a kind of a yeah. Spanish element to it. Very, too. Yeah, like, Sun Also Rises, I think, like, the bulls. Yeah, yeah, with the matadors and stuff, yeah. It's pretty sick, but, but he's, like, a this war correspondent guy it's almost like semi-autobiographical which is kind of what he does i think <laughs> yeah, um, yeah but he goes kind of fighting the um Francesco franco's forces during uh post world war um kind of that what do you call it trial ground for nazism essentially like where it was run and he's like a, a resistance fighter in a, in a sense and then he falls for this girl when he's there and it's just it's just one of those like i mean it's hemingway so you just know it's not going to be like super chill but yeah yeah <laughs> i found that a lot of 
my favorite author is do kind of do that semi autobiographical thing you're talking about where like I know I've said I'm drilling Murakami's name into the ground but all of his books are based on he says what could have happened to him like he mm. could have been that character so he kind of knows how that character would move around and do certain things it's like the age-old argument like the midnight in Paris argument where uh where Hemingway's all like you can only write about things that you personally experience and then F. Scott Fitzgerald's like, no, man, you can, yeah. you can do whatever yeah. you want. So totally. I do think that yeah. you haven't seen it. No, F. Scott. I'm, I'm saying like, oh. I'm thinking about, I've only read Gatsby. I got to read the other ones. Like, yeah. Marat's always talking about them too. Yeah. Yeah. That guy. I introduced him to it for the record, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Noted. <laughs> no, um. But yeah, I'd, I'd read The Ga Great Gatsby and it was probably four years before I read another one. So, mm. but it's just so much more famous than his other works. And I, it's strange how sometimes this seems to happen, but it seems like sometimes authors have more than one work that will really resonate. But a lot of times there'll just be one work that's like an American classic for for the uh, Great Gatsby as an example, or like it's going to live forever. Like this story was so well told that it's just. And I think I read it because it blew up after he died, right? Because it was sent to people in the military overseas. Yeah. I read it. it was one of those books chosen to be sent over. Yeah. And that kind of planned the seed and it kind of blew up off that. It's so, there's so much, there's got to be so much amount of chance involved in how those things happen. That's like, um, so interesting. Yeah. So interesting. How he's renting like, the mansions and he had these manic issues. Like, yeah, there's so, there's just so much. I, I love books that you can just read and reread and reread, and there's still something to get from it. Um, uh, but yeah, it, I mean, even like Toni Morrison is a good example of someone who has, she wrote many books that were good, but I feel like, I feel like, um, you know, there's usually like Song of Solomon's pretty good too, but Beloved seems to be the one that just resonates with people. Yeah. Just yeah. stays kind of thing. Um, another example, Octavia E. Butler had The Parable of the Sower as kind of her main thing. And like, there's other great books as well. It just seems, it's such an interesting, and, and I think this is the case sometimes with songs or with any form of art or with business ideas or with political movements or anything you can live your whole life and the most important thing you ever do can be one moment or you know and you might never know what what that was like after you die or something so like there's that thing with songwriters they don't know what song is going to be a hit they may think it's gonna be another song and that song gets like it's the least popular on the album mm. but it's, there's no formula to like maybe get a feeling it's a good song but you don't know if it's going to be the one that it shoots off skyrockets there's no way to know you yeah. can kind of if the work is good and that's really all you can go off of yeah i've heard some i can't remember who said it now but definitely heard the advice that don't trust your understanding of how good your own creative works are too much and just like put it out because when you've been spending so much time working on something and, and i i think what this person was saying is more so Actually, I think it was Neil Gaiman. It was Neil Gaiman, yeah. Mm -hmm. He was saying he doesn't necessarily know which of his works is going to be a great and which one's just going to be okay. Um, the best thing you can do is work really hard on your thing and make it as good as you can. But at the end of the day, you can't just hold it back. You, eventually, you have, to, you have to give yourself a time in which you let it go to the world and become whatever it's going to become kind of idea. So I thought that was really interesting. I have to let it go. And you know, the, the market grabs it and kind of does what it does with it. And if it becomes popular, it's popular. If it doesn't like you yeah. can't control it at that point. But in a way too, like if it only resonates with one person, but it really resonates with them, that might be just as cool in a way too. Right. An author isn't really looking to just get mass appeal, I guess they gross. It would kind of conflict with their ideas and what they write because yeah. if you have that influence while you're writing it's I think that I don't know I'm not a writer but I, I feel like that could be a negative factor for sure 
if you have that thing in the back of your head, like, oh, but is this going to make New York Times best selling? Like, yeah, there, it's got to affect it somehow. It's probably counterproductive to that. It's probably the same as in, in any sort of medium, like film as well, right? Like, I'm sure um, there's certain films that are made knowing they're going to have a huge audience and a huge budget, like the MCU films are all yeah, yeah, made. Yeah. But the first Iron Man wasn't supposed to be big, you know? John Favreau didn't know that was going to be yeah. huge. So that's that's like an outlier to that philosophy that, oh, they were going to know it's going to be big. Yeah, if you're doing a sequel, maybe you do. But with the original idea, with the original Avatar, like oh, you, there's no way to know that that was going to be as big as it was. And you can tell when there's heart in something. If you compare the Incredible Hulk, Edward Norton to you know, <laughs> the first Iron Man that came out the same year. Yeah. Which one drove the MCU? Like which? Definitely Avatar not the Hulk. Avro <laughs> and RDJ, obviously, because they had the heart in it. And they rewrote the script over and over, and it's. Yeah, no, it's no nothing political driven by the studio. It's just, you know, yeah, it's, it's the intuition. It goes back to like yes. they were doing what they felt was right with the IP they had, and it worked because it was true. Yes, that's wow. Yeah, it's so true. With your experience as somebody who's done some acting and has been really involved in both as an actor and as a consumer of film. Like we talk a lot about films for people who don't know. Uh, Maxwell's super knowledgeable um, with, with films and, and kind of what's good, what's going on in the world and also older films as well. Um, anyways, so what's your kind of, uh, what's kind of your decision-making process in how you've kind of done uh, moved away now from acting but you were you were involved in it for a while like I just maybe want you to talk a little bit about that process and uh and how yeah. intuition kind of played a role well the thing like we discussed earlier with you know working out or anything you have to have that that supplementary passion for it to make up for that loss of like it's not a guaranteed thing you gotta love doing it so mm -hmm. that you can withstand it because obviously like acting is you know, I've been acting, like, I got my agent, I was in grade six when I got her, and, like, recently last year, I kind of cut things off, because I just, it was seven years, seven or eight years I was with her, and I just kind of lost that steam, like, I, it, it's not one of those things where it's like, oh, it's time to give up, like, it's time to focus on school, it's been too long, it was like, I just didn't feel that, the discipline to do it, never mind the motivation, like, I just didn't, feel that anymore because acting is it's kind of brutal like if and I'm sure you know you've been going to auditions too yeah and you you don't hear anything back like the year before I quit I was on hold or shortlisted for six projects and it's like I didn't get some pretty big ones too right recurring stuff and I didn't get and I was kind of like well I, it's that thing where it's like you're digging and there's the diamonds behind the wall and you stop yeah. right there but that's all it's just a I don't know. It's like, I'm afraid my relatively inexperienced heart could not <laughs> withstand right. another. <laughs> exactly. Like my yeah. intuition just didn't, I didn't feel like it was in my best interest to do anymore. And if I do feel like I want to do it again, I'll go back to it. I can, I can hop right back into it. But as of right now, it's just the industry. It's kind of heartless. You have to just really support yourself with your own drive. It's not anything external. You're not getting feedback by the casting directors. And yeah, it's very cold. It's a very cold industry to be in. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that it's, it's a kind of it's commercial. It's, cool. it's like the coolest thing, but it's also like, yeah, kind of fruitless most of the time. But it, it's commercializing an art form, right? Yeah. And so it's not something where, I mean, it sucks even when you don't get your job or when you have graduated and you can't get the position that you want in your, you know, microeconomics degree is not like getting you exactly where you wanted it to. That's yeah. one thing. But when it's like you're doing auditions, you're putting your heart and soul into these and you're, you're saying like, I'm being as truthful as I can. Like, this is real for me. And then they don't even respond like that. That can be like La La Land. 
<laughs> yeah, like every every actor watches La, La Land and they're just like everyone's had that thing. yeah like but it's not my dad's always like oh you're so like I don't know how you kept up with all the auditions all the no's like I couldn't do that which is rejection you it's not anything that breaks you down really you just kind of have to if you love it enough yeah but I, I'd be lying if I said acting wasn't something that's interesting because it was also something that paid well when you got that job or else I would do stage. That's true. Which I had, which, you know, we did stage stuff in high school. Yeah, we had more experience. I, would, if I really had that passion to that level, I would do stage, but, you know. But do you think it's maybe just being in Vancouver is a little different? Like, if you were in New York or, like, London, I feel like doing stage would be kind of feasible. I mean, you could still do it here, but it just, it doesn't seem as... Just here, you have to be more driven by passion than over there because you will make money over there. Sometimes. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, like you can do it anywhere driven by passion, but if there's no chance of, of being like the best of the best, and, and it's one of those industries too where, where you just, I don't know. It's like... It seems, you feel like you need to be the best. Yeah. Or else you're nothing. You're like, if I'm not the next Ryan Gosling, then what am I kind of idea? It's like, I don't know. Yeah. yeah so totally. how do you, how do you see yourself in relation to acting as an art form now? Do you think that it's something that you, or do you think that like directing or something related to film will be like a part of your life at some point? Or for now, are you just saying, you know, I gave it a shot. This, um, my intuition tells me that I'm no longer kind of um, really doing this for the right reasons and I need to try doing something else. I can't say that like direction really catches my eye necessarily because I don't feel like I have those huge ideas, those momentous like mm. things to drive a studio to pick me up to like in building my credits through TV and I don't think I'm really there. I am interested in like the production side of it like the business side of it, the behind the scenes, behind the camera. I'm interested in how that all works with everything in the studios and mm -hmm. coordinating that stuff, the logistics. I, I kind of like that side. Um, yeah. But for acting itself, um, you know, I, I can say I gave my shot at it for seven years on and off, mostly off, I guess. <laughs> During school. I, I only really gave it, I only went really hard when it was right after grad yeah uh, that year I was really drilling into it I think it was a a mix of me getting shortlisted so many times and the pandemic hitting I was like I'm I need to just cut it I was I was gonna ask that too because it seemed now I wasn't like as involved with it during this time period because I was more kind of heavy in school but you and Marat were both working mm -hmm. a lot on doing auditions together and stuff yeah it seemed like a fun vibe. It seemed like you guys were having a good time. And it was one of those situations where it's like, you could have maybe sustained it even though with all these rejections, but I feel like the pandemic must have been one of those big, big kind of factors in, in that. Well, you can, you can ask them. Um, but I think you'll say the same thing. I think we were kind of losing steam even before because we were thinking we had this white, this little white board in his room and we would write our goals on it. Yeah. And it'd be like, oh, we're in LA like next May. And we write yeah. that down. Like we because it's because we were expecting stuff so soon that we were driven like that for that year. But when it doesn't pay off, you kind of it's like an exponential, like it falls off. You can ask Marat, Marat, like he lost it too. Like it was that kind of thing where I think we pushed ourselves too hard for that goal and we kind of killed it for ourselves. Mm. So do you think that? that that's a dangerous thing to do then to push goals too hard when you're working like first if you were trying to give advice to somebody who's trying to do something that they really like would you say that it's not a good idea to push it too I, hard I when it crosses that line between you really like when it when it goes into that section of you loving what you're doing when it kind of crosses over into like you're not doing it for acting anymore. You're doing it to move to a certain place or to do like it's once you start taking away from your passion, I think start eating away at it. I think that's really harmful. Mm. But not to say like I, I could see myself going back into it, 
but just right now I don't have that drive quite back yet. I'd say. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and I guess uh, studying kind of the business elements too right now is, is not a bad idea because you're, they're still going to be useful. That's why I, li I like business because you know, everything is business, every single thing. It's how money moves around. Like you need, I think just knowing how stuff works is important. Yeah. I think having a good kind of like last podcast I did with Nathan, he was talking a lot about his like economic intuition and how it's kind of built as he's been studying towards his urban planning projects. And I, I think that, I think that no matter what you do, having a good understanding of how markets work and what drives market behavior is super important because it's not going away right markets are i mean even for people who are like down with capitalism or something it's like you don't really have a good understanding because everything's capitalism and there's an, it's like that that's like saying down with human nature or something it's like okay but you know it's not gonna happen <laughs> you know and people don't like to hear it but there is a natural hierarchy and science is funded by capitalism and it's yeah whole thing but like i don't want to get too much into that but like no <laughs> you have to develop your own ideas at least at the minimum you have to develop your own kind of view of everything yeah that's paramount like you need to have something independent that isn't fed to you there's a balance too of responsibility and taking like i don't know i think it'd be a good thing if everyone took radical responsibility for themselves that's a good thing but at the same time people should take responsibility for groups they're a part of and for things that are happening. Like you can't just completely um, let things be and never help anyone because not everyone's afforded with the same opportunities to begin with. That's, that's super important to remember. You educate yourself about something. You will be pushed around. I don't like, I don't care who you are. If you aren't educated on that topic and you don't know enough about what's going on, you will be moved around how other people would like. Mm. That's why I also think reading's important because you do get to get those different sides. You can read on certain political philosophies, economic philosophy, and you can kind of put together what you agree with and build mm. your principles really off that. Yeah, I've been really trying to, um, just for myself, minimize my exposure to media recently because I've been learning so much by reading and in order to, to truly digest those thoughts. And I think it's still your onus to read really widely and read books that you disagree with so that you're challenged with some of these other ideas and you're not completely, you don't become someone who only thinks. It's empathy. You got to yeah. understand how the other people are thinking too. And the thing is, no one is evil. There's no good or bad. It's different ideals that people truly believe in. Yeah. Understand why they think of that without kind of block ethic. I'm right. No, I'm right. And trying to convince them. It's like, where are you actually coming from? Like, I want to understand why you think like that. So true. And and I've I think that it's it's strange and maybe this isn't the case everywhere, but it seems like recently, maybe with the rise of PC culture, et cetera, et cetera, it's sometimes kind of scary talking with people because you're like, it's not even like um, you disagree with them and they get mad at you. It's like, you could not agree with them with the correct terms and get like in trouble. And it's just like, um, I think that's why for me, like, I just decided like, it's really important to have conversations. That's why I'm doing the podcast. I think it's really important to talk with as many different people as I can. Absolutely. And it's really important for me to read and really, really try to you know, educate myself in a wide variety of ways before I start making these kind of statements of like, this is how we should solve this problem. Like, who am I to say something like that? I'm 21. I don't know anything. <laughs> and I love how really unbiased your podcast is. And it's based on that storytelling aspect. And that isn't sectioning off people. That's kind of, it's everyone. Anyone can come in and talk their talk and you can kind of pick their brain. And that's the, that's it. the dream that I'll be able to open my own mind and become less kind of because I know that I have my own biases and I don't even know what those biases are because I don't think any of us really know what our biases are until we reach different people and we talk with different people and say oh I was biased against a particular element or group that that person belonged to mm -hmm. and then I talked with them and I 
now I'm not as much because I realize that there's more difference between individuals than between, you know, those groups. And learning, you know, it's also admitting that you were wrong. It's admitting that oh, I'm sorry, I did that in the past, or I thought like that in the past, or I judged you based off that in the past. Like, I'm sorry, I'm changed now. I'm learning and that has to be accepted. You have to let people change like that too. Totally. Yeah. Like, forgiveness yeah. Is, is like a fundamental that's holding it over people like oh but you used to be like that it's like just letting people change because as soon as you gatekeep that stuff nothing's going to happen well yeah it, it's like a pretty simple thought experiment if you penalize people who changed because of things they did in the past you're not incentivizing change and they won't change. That double up on their past point yeah if you if if i say like maxwell you know used to wear green shirts and wearing green shirts is not okay so, and you're like, oh, okay, like I'm not, I don't wear green shirts anymore, but I'm like, because you wore green shirts, we're not going to let you in. You're just going to keep wearing green shirts because it doesn't make a difference. But on four green shirts. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, everyone knows it's not it. okay to wear green yeah. shirts. Exactly. Very, very offensive to those of us who have been attacked by people with green shirts. It's taken that level of... <laughs> It's also, it's also <laughs> controlling your reactiveness to a situation, like how someone comes out and being, as Covey would say, being proactive. Mm. And it's that whole thing where you can, the one thing you can change is your mind and how you accept information, what you do with it. It's the Viktor Frankl, like, oh, yeah. like you have that power. So when someone does something, offend, like if they're changing, you get to have that step in your mind where you can totally let it go. Like you can change any situation really without taking it to heart and getting reactive and your amygdala takes over and yeah yeah no that's totally true like the fear system in the brain is yeah. is wired to react to situ stressful situations and since we don't have many behaviorally stressful as in like you're not getting chased by saber saber tooth saber tooth tiger anywhere um all the stresses we get in our lives are social stresses and so you know if if you're in your day to day, that's where most of that energy is coming from. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think Viktor Frankl, like, I don't know, Man's Search for Meaning is such an important book. It really, really is. The way that he talks about how he found meaning as a Jewish man interned in a concentration camp, seeing everyone around him, like, one objectively, one of the worst situations anyone could find themselves in. Yeah. Yeah. Objectively. Yeah. And no matter what you think, no matter what you think religiously, politically, idealistically, anyway, we can all be certain that suffering is the most real thing that we know for sure that it is. So I think what he has to say in light of what he went through is just, you and know, the three ways um, suffering, it was find meaning, right? Yeah. Work, love, and find meaning in your suffering, right? Yeah. 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 I think uh, I'm not going to look for it. I have it right there, but even if I did find it, I'd have to flip through it. And, but yeah, but, but it comes back to like, we don't remember exactly every single thing about it, but you remember the philosophy, you remember the approach that he yeah. took and how he found meaning and how he survived by finding meaning and not giving into despair. Exactly. You don't need to memorize all his logo therapy terms and like you don't need as long as you have that general idea, that's the important thing he's trying to get across. Yeah, totally. Like learning isn't memorization. Learning's understanding the material and being able to reiterate it and talk about it, like how we're talking right now. I think that's the point where like once you reach the understanding, that's the point of every book. It's not to be able to cite this paragraph, like I don't know. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's really important. And especially interesting, as you mentioned earlier, with how the education systems certainly don't seem to be updated yearly, uh, at very generously, maybe, you know, every right. decade. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's so true, because it does a lot of, how should I say this, a lot of the success in university or high schools or education, formal education, is reliant on your ability to replicate, to memorize and to regurgitate information and 
to look like you're not doing it, but really to do it. It's really just how, like, can you write the right ideas in an essay that isn't plagiarizing? So how can you like iterate the same thing without exactly doing the same thing? Yeah. But I think a lot of times the useful information in life is how do you integrate it into yourself and create a new thing? But if you try to be creative in university, you're not always rewarded for it. Whereas you are always rewarded for going to the safe route and reiterating their ideas. Totally. I think in school, like you're given the scenarios and like solve it based on this scenario. I think a different course that would be more effective is what is this scenario and how would you go about solving it? Cause that's on the job experience. That's like free. No one's telling you how exactly to do it and how to regurgitate. Cause it doesn't matter if it's to a T what that thing, like it's, it's not you being able to exactly do that response. It's doing the right response. That's more important. Yeah. Does that makes sense. Yeah. I think um, like uh the late Ken Robinson like talks a lot about the education um, of creativity and find people in their element and how how that can just be so much more effective. Um, and I should also just point out that like two 21 year old guys or whatever, like trying to solve like education and be like, these are all the wrong things. And like, this is how it should be done on anything i would say i'm not an expert on anything yeah yeah we're not we're not trying to do that and we're not even thinking that our ideas are 100 percent correct and yeah. i don't even have the arrogance to think that like i have an opinion therefore everyone must listen to it because that's stupid as well but um <laughs> but it is i think important to start talking about these things and you know reading books by people who are really educated in that subject like ken robbins is a good example and seeing you know our experience at langley fine arts just how positive that was and comparing that with people who went to more kind of stilted education systems and just saying maybe it is better to incentivize creativity rather than just a system i think if you were to take any point from us talking as like an outside point of view i think it wouldn't be to listen to any of our points or take anything to heart at all i think it would be that conversation is important and self-education is important. It doesn't matter what, you, I don't care what you self-educate about. I just think you should be able to build those, the foundational, you know, principles of what you believe in. I think that's the most important thing of what we're talking about, what this shows. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And just finding stories in life and allowing yourself to resonate with them. Because humans are storytellers and we have to have a story to tell we have to have a kind of um thought process that we identify with and we all do and i think that i think that the problem can arise the problems can arise when you're told your story is not interesting or your story is not important or someone is told that you know they're not a famous actor and therefore you know their means of expression is not as important and um, uh, I don't know. I think everyone needs to be given opportunities to tell stories. And maybe the best thing that we can do day to day is just listen to people and, and put aside our own self-interest enough to let people have moments where they can really just have the floor and express something that's interesting. We'll have to be able to be free to learn and fail over and over again, yeah. or else nothing else will develop past that. You know, people will be too afraid and they'll stick to their same, like maybe it, they have this dogmatic idea that they grew up with and they're not going past that boundary because they're afraid. Yeah. So in my experience growing up and trying to work on different projects, the best lessons have invariably been the ones that I've made a huge mistake and failed. And then outside of that failure, look back on it and seen that there was something I could have done differently or mm -hmm. something that I could have approached differently in yeah. your experience. Is that true? Has that been, have, have there been moments where you've learned a lot from failure or um, what do you think about that idea that failure is maybe the best teacher? Yeah. I think it goes without saying that failure is the most important thing for learning though. Like, cause pe I think people do discredit succeeding. <laughs> 
I think success is a good indicator, but it isn't as concrete as failing. Mm. Failing is like, you did this wrong. Like yeah. that's out of the equation. You did that wrong. So you have all this other stuff to look at, but winning. You've eliminated a possibility. Yeah. Succeeding is like, oh, but was there a better way I could do it? I don't know. Mm. Like I got through it, but you don't even really, if you succeed at something, you don't tend to look back and think and pick it apart. Why did I succeed? As opposed to like, if you fail, you're like, why did I fail? Like, and you need to know. So I do think um, mm. succeeding does get kind of underweighed in that argument. But I think failure, you know, of course, like if you fail, you will learn something. If you go forward after failing, you'll learn something. If you give up after failing, you give up. But if you yeah, do, then you just fail. Forward, you can't help but learn something. Subconsciously, I won't do that again. Like it has to happen. Yeah, it's really interesting that you say that too, because that's basically the fundamental, um, the basis of science is falsifiability, mm -hmm. that you're, you don't prove something just by showing that something works. The only way that science works is by disproving as many possible things as you can, and then trying to prove that the one thing you found that did work is in fact the best option by disproving all the other things you can think of. Right. And then, you know, a good example, uh, Newton with gravity, best hypothesis for a long time. Great. Good job. And then Einstein comes along some few hundred years later and offers a better one. And now that one's the one that is accepted. Right. So it's cool. Cause we know that like whatever we're doing, it's not the best, but we're shedding off these options that we know are worse. Yeah. yeah. You know, science is very objective cream rise to the top. It's the best thing. It's not like maybe this, maybe that. other than theories. I mean, you just need theories for everything. That's just, that's where you can't prove it. That's the only case. Yeah. Yeah. But even theories are like your best guess at the given time, you know, or like the theory of evolution is like the best kind of thing we have right now. It's like, yeah, there could be some other explanation that can come about, but there's really no point thinking about it because it makes sense with what we know right now. And it's the best kind of understanding that we have of the world. But also don't be too arrogant and don't be like, it's okay. Like I saw it with my own eyes. Like I know that like nope. all this stuff happened like 85 billion years ago. It's like you, you, we think nope. that, that happened so far, but yeah. Like the circle of influence, don't worry about it too much, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. What are you going to do? <laughs> yeah. The circle of influence. Yeah. At the end of the day, you're, I think cynicism too, it comes down to this idea of like, what I'm doing right now, is it going to matter in 2000 years? Like, no, it's not. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't work as hard as you can towards something and really try to do something valuable. You know? Yeah. Totally. Like you, you have, you have a life right now. That's all that you know. And you're, you're working on that thing. You know, you, you are trying to read as many books as you can. I'm trying to learn as much as I can too. Cause right now we're in a pandemic. There's not much else we can do. Right. And you know, you have to be hopeful and say, things are going to get better eventually. But for now, I can focus on, you know, learning as much as I can and just growing. And that maybe is the best thing I can do right now. And the earlier you learn, the earlier it compounds, the earlier you move on other stuff, you understand. Like, I think the earlier you kind of put that stake in the ground and kind of like, I think I kind of like thinking like this right now. I think that's very important. As early as you can, mm -hmm. kind of gaining that mindset where you're like, oh, I'm like this kind of person right now and knowing who you are. Hmm. You want to elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. That's an interesting I, idea. I, I just think having like self knowledge and knowing, like, know who you are not, that kind of thing. Where I know I'm not. thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Did you read Green Lights? I did. Did you? Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a really great book for people who haven't read it. I really liked it. I thought it was, it was better than I thought it would be. But yeah, yeah like, know He's what you're He's a very know. smart dude. You, you gotta know what you identify with and what you don't to kind of build yourself or else it's kind of aimless and random and you know randomness it's like wasted energy like you kind of have to have a direction that kind of philosophy ethos type of thing like you have to know who you relate with I think that's really important and then based off that you can maybe change direction later but you have to have a direction to go in you can't be like oh I this 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 you're not going anywhere yeah yeah, I think, I think that having something to work towards. Yeah, but balance in that direction without being biased, I think is the real challenge. 
have a direction without being biased. Yeah, balancing that, having that direction, that ethos without being completely like tunnel vision on it. I think that's super yeah. important. But I think an, another thing too, that I've been realizing recently from the neurological perspective, um, but it, it works importantly into the way we live our lives too, is that it's objectively impossible to be even moderately free of bias. Every single thing you think is bias, essentially. Like if you actually had no bias, you would be the least useful person on the planet because you wouldn't be able to group anything together. You would say like, you would treat every instance as exactly a novel thing. You would be trying to drive a car. Every stop sign you come to would be like a different thing. You'd be like, what, what is this? I don't, I don't get it. So you have to be able to categorize and categories are really, really useful. Like from, you know, many, many options, many different things uh, that you can look at and say, oh, okay, we can categorize this and this together because they have so much in common. And yes, there's going to be some things that don't fit perfectly into both those categories, but they're useful enough that we need to kind of bias ourselves towards thinking of things like that sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, bias, it's we can't make it too extreme, right? It's got to be a balance. Bias is not a, you know, you can't purposely really, it's t it, like your brain puts stuff together anyways. It relates stuff yeah. and that's like that, like. Um, Quite physically, literally how it works, like neurons connect yeah. and relate different yeah. ideas. Yeah. Your brain will just put stuff together, lump stuff together that kind of makes sense for it. So it's really hard to not, not have a bias. Like it's impossible, unless you can control your you know, your limbic system, it's impossible. Like your brain works very seamless ways. Like it in thinking fast and slow, the fast part of it is that part we're talking about now. Like how a better mm -hmm. looking politician will likely get elected. That kind of thing where you relate good looks to good political standing. Like it's that type of thing. Your brain just connects stuff like that. Yeah. And the vote voting patterns is a really interesting example of that. Yeah. I, I got to read that book, but I've definitely seen evidence of the same thing from like experimental studies that I've looked at in, in like psychopharmacology classes and stuff where they just show like, you know, this, um, this particular, okay. Like in psychopharmacology is like about drugs. So this particular drug, you know, it, this is exactly how it functions on the brain and it makes you think in this way, which kind of exemplify or, um, exaggerates uh this natural thing where we tend to be more receptive to this kind of person or this physical attribute of something you know and it's the same with interpersonal elements of psychology too where you see you're like and it makes sense evolutionarily too like why you'd be attracted to people whose faces are symmetrical right it's it's not it's not completely just you know you're a terrible person it's like no you're just we how it works in our brains because we're two hundred thousand years old right and it's yeah. like if you think like how short like the past hundred years was compared to everything it's crazy like the industrial agricultural phases leading up like how much of a blip it is and we cannot control how we think it's so deep and embedded it's impossible. We're hunter gatherers, like as, as Maxwell would say, the reptilian brain. <laughs> reptilian, like you, it's there's no use trying to control. You just have to understand. I think is the important thing. Yeah, well, there is some use trying to control. Like if you have like particularly heinous reptilian impulses, like yeah, you should try to control it. Inputs. Yeah, control inputs is the most tangible thing you can control, but yeah, like you can't control your thoughts, but you can control your actions. The active stuff, your amygdala, like mm -hmm. it's tough at that point. But yeah, understanding yeah. how it works, I think, is the most important thing. Yeah, it's such it's such an interesting topic. Um, but yeah, definitely, definitely not as simple as just you're a bad person. It's like no, you just you just did a bad thing. <laughs> Right. It's not, it's, it's, it's something that happened because of, like you said, 200,000 years of, but that's also not an excuse too. Like, I think that's important to see. It's just a, a way of understanding and empathizing with elements of your f physical brain.
that doesn't give you the excuse to do things and just say, it's just because my brain works that way. That's not a good excuse either. No excuse, but it's understanding why it happens. And a lot of people don't dig deep and they like to form their own thoughts on stuff without basing it on any foundation. Mm. Like uh, you can, it's a Google search away. Like, why are we like this? What's happening here? And some people going, oh, but it's like that. And they build this whole thing off of, it's a weak foundation. Like everything's yeah. out there. I think people just have to educate themselves. Have you ever done that too, where you're you're trying to, to figure out something like, and then you just Google super like stupidly specific leading questions. It's like, yeah. why are the insides of our brains made of cheese? You know? And then it's like, you'll find somebody who gives you like a super long explanation about how your brain's literally made of cheese. Like you can just find the most ridiculous things. And if you make them slightly less ridiculous, you can find things that are believable. So it's just, you have to be really careful what you, you believe and how you research allow, things you have to allow what goes in your like you have to have a kind of you have to control the gateway of what you let into your brain and kind of bounce around in there because if you look at the wrong stuff on if you watch random youtube videos weird ideas and stuff it'll eventually get to you yeah and the way the algorithm works you'll just get more of that weird stuff and then it will seem like everything's like that you know, you know i think i think with anything i've talked about in this podcast i've been guilty of doing the opposite to every single thing i've talked about i've had to have been guilty at some point like i can't be a hypocrite and like i've done everything wrong probably before but it's like to, yeah. effort of trying to do right thing. yeah i think it's like like you say it's it's doing it right trying to learn that i did this thing this is not something I want to continue to do and then trying to change. That's the best anyone can do, right? Everyone starts with, with these, like we talked about these ingrained ways of thinking that are not always helpful in a 21st century world because they might've been developed for a hunter gatherer world. So all you can do is acknowledge things when they happen and say, Hey, yeah, I've, I've looked at something and been completely guilty of that. I'm going to try not to do that anymore. Mm. But I think that's super reasonable. There, should, we, there shouldn't be any stigma against that. Yeah, that's what I'd think too. But you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> apparently the world is telling you that's not the case. But also, the like the same thing happens with the uh, the YouTube channel thing that you go down. You know, you start watching these strange videos and then all you get now on your recommendations are these strange videos. Social media works like that on steroids, right? So if you're relying on that for some any form of information, you have to know the information you're getting is going to be so unbelievably biased and you could f grab somebody else's phone living in another part of the world and see completely opposite information and be like, wait, what's happening? So those external influences and it's all just branching off of media, the idea of media and you know, letting something have power over what you see. And that whole thing is like, you got to know what's happening. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying any media, I'm not pointing out certain things. Everything's biased. I don't care what media thing you watch. It's biased and just know it's biased and kind of go off that. Yeah. You can't go into something like, oh, it's fact. This is fact. This is fact. And then you cite that source. This is fact. And then you branch off that and that's your foundation. I think that's, I don't know. Yeah. You have to be, you have to be careful not to, not to do any of that kind of stuff. All right, bro. Um, one last question. This has been a great conversation so far. Thanks so much for hopping on. Yeah. Thanks um, for me. But I've been asking everyone just one question at the end, which is if you could tell one story, or one message and you could get that message through all the noise and all the misdirection in the world and really have it resonate with people. What would that story or message or kind of lesson be? I would say to, you know, learn and find your own values of what you like build your own personal view of everything without having to say other people, like having a true understanding of what you want to do 
and who you want to be friends with and what type of things you see day to day, what you let take up your time. Mm. I think selectively choosing all that with a direction is like the most important thing. Mm. I love that. Yeah. I think that's super, super uh, helpful for developing kind of a examined life instead of a, uh, instead of just letting yourself go down whatever tangential rabbit holes you might have your reptilian brain might take. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, brother. It's been great having you on here. And uh, we'll have to have you back soon. So we can continue talking about I'm sure there's so much we didn't get to but uh, yeah, this will sure. go on thank very long. On. Sorry. Thank you for having me on. It's been a lot of fun. Of course. Thank you for tuning in to episode eight of at the base of the baobab tree. I hope that you got some value and that you enjoyed this episode and please join us for episode nine, which will be coming soon.